So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, June the 30th. That's right, last day of June. And uh, our Independence Day is coming up here next week and everybody's talking about that. Big travel weekend. This is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers episode number 213. I'm Frederick Dunn and this is the way to be. So I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you so much for the time that you spend watching. It's the whole reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. So, if you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description, and the topics will be there, as always, one after the other, and any pertinent links that I think will give you more information or maybe take you to something that we mentioned today. So, the topics were submitted during the past week, and I appreciate that. Challenging weather situation going on. What is going on outside right now? 79 degrees Fahrenheit. What's that in Celsius? 26. We have dangerous smoke levels, continuing dangerous smoke levels. And for some reason, right where I live, northeastern United States, we're in the path of some heavy stuff. So it's all color coded. Goes from green, that's okay. Yellow, don't go out and run a marathon. And then we get into the reds, which means for some people, it's dangerous just to be outside. And then when it goes to burgundy, it's even worse. I don't know what you're supposed to do. I'm really glad that we have those um, almost HEPA filter quality uh, central heat and air conditioning filters that go in that will actually take smoke out of the air because that's really what we need right now. I was going to do today's question and answer in my Way to Be Academy building with the bees, but uh, you can actually smell it and almost taste the air with, with every breath. So not very healthy out there. And of course, just to follow up on the survey that I did, which is on my YouTube channel, the YouTube channel is titled Frederick Dunn. And the question was for those that are in the high smoke areas who keep bees, do you think that this is negatively impacting your bees or not? Well, as of today, there are 91 responses. That's not very much considering the number of viewers and subscribers that we have. But 56% of those reported that they had a negative impact on their bees. In other words, the bees' foraging was reduced. Some of them are not leaving their hives and so on. So 56% had impact that they could see, that they could tell. All right, so, and rain is possible, 40% today. I think uh, maybe a little higher percentage tomorrow. And uh, we really need the rain because the rain will actually knock some of these particulates out of the air. And of course, everything that's growing outside needs rain as well as sunshine. And it's so diffused. It's so weird. So I want to give you kind of a sense of what the scale is of the fire that's been sending all that smoke and all those particulates our way. Well, it's in Canada for starters. The other thing is you might think, man, if it's that big of a fire and that much of an issue... Why isn't everybody up there putting these fires out? I want to give you the sense of scale. First of all, who has sent firefighters to the scene? Canada, of course, because it's their land. And uh, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, France, Portugal, Spain, Mexico, Chile, and Costa Rica have all sent firefighting experts to help combat the blaze. So also to give you a sense of scale, how much of Canada has been involved in the actual fire? How much land has burned or is burning? 19,704,183 acres are listed as destroyed. Now, what does that mean, destroyed? Because often people will say, as soon as you mention that, well, you know, these fires are natural, and then, of course, they will regrow, and uh, they'll replenish themselves because they certainly have had huge fires long before mankind was ever here. Although some of these fires, contributing factors, something else I looked into, human carelessness is among those. So anyway, in accordance with the Canadian Forest Service, they say 95% of these burned areas uh, should recover. In what time frame? within 50 years. So the impact is huge. I don't want to be negative, but I do want to share that this would be the time probably to be vigilant if you're in an area as we are where things are pretty dry. And uh, that's all over the country. If you're going to have any kind of outdoor fire, you probably want to be aware that things could get out of hand. Thank goodness uh, we don't have the issues that Canada has. But it kind of shows that the world is not, you know, 
fires and things like that and all the smoke and the air that we breathe and the climate around the world does not know boundaries. So I'm glad to see that all these different countries are trying to fight the blaze. How long is that supposed to last? They don't know. Months. They're telling us all summer long we're going to see this. So we're actually changing our activities around it. But for me right here, borderline uh, the burgundy color, which is the darkest and the worst, the heaviest impact, uh, my bees seem to be flying normally. They're foraging. They're doing everything that I would expect them to do. And they're still doing extremely well to the point where we have to manage them, which leads us to things like this. Question and answers about beekeeping. So let's go right into the very first question. If you want to know how to submit a topic of your own, you go to thewaytobee.org. And there's a page in the left margin. You have to scroll down, the way to be. Click on that. There's a form. You can fill it out and have your topic considered for next Friday. So Tony T, 1596, that's his YouTube channel, says, I'd like to know how to inspect a hive without killing bees. I move as slow and gently as possible. I try to smoke the bees off the edges when putting boxes back. I sweep off or smoke the top of the hive when placing the inner cover. And yet, in spite of all this, I end up killing a few bees. Also, how do you deal with wonky comb? Okay, well, I just realized I forgot something that I was going to bring with me today to show you about it, but I'll just describe it instead because um, it's not that complicated. I, uh, as a YouTuber, photographer, whatever, when I have a computer issue, I take care of my own computer. So I have these big desktop computers. They're obnoxious. In fact, they're so big that I often leave the sides off of them so that I can access and swap out parts and things like that. What does that have to do with beekeeping? Well, I'm glad you asked because often dust will build up inside and debris. And so there are cans of canned air. You can puff those, but you know what? If you puff them too much, a fluid comes out and hits things. And I don't want that. I don't want that on my photography equipment either. I don't want to hit lenses with it. I don't want fluid coming out and landing on things. But I thought about it. How cool would it be? Because often there's that one little pesky bee that is right where you need to have cleared so you can put your boxes back and things like that. And then if you puffed it with a can of air, well, same thing. I don't know what's in that. I don't want the propellant to get out onto my bees. But Guess what I found out? There are high velocity electric rechargeable air dusters. And if you look at them on YouTube, you can just Google it. And uh, there's lots of YouTubers that have made videos about them. And uh, they do these blast tests, the electronic one, which just has a filter in it. And of course the air just blows its outside air that cycles through and it's got a high velocity fan in it. And then you've got the standard ones in the can, and they have puff tests, puff competitions. Well, the electronic one that plugs in and recharges, and they're not that expensive, when you consider what the canned air costs. Dust in a, duster in a can, whatever it's called. Anyway, when you spray these electronic ones, it revs up, and it's got different power levels. The one I purchased has three, and you can blow all the bees off the top. It's really good, and it's small. It'll sit in your pocket. So you don't have to lose it. You're probably going to mess it up because your hands are going to have propolis on them and everything else. However, it worked really well in blowing bees out of the way and you get just enough time. Now, why not just lean forward and blow at them with your breath? And I think we know that bees don't like your breath. They will move, but sometimes they just get mad and go right at your face. So blowing them with your breath isn't that great either. But this low velocity air or high velocity air, whatever level you need to get that one bee off of there, buys you time to put everything back. So there are some other practices that help you get the bees out of the way. And uh, one of them, sometimes it backfires. Here's the thing. You go to do your inspection and let's say your bees are really doing great, like ours are right now. And we just recently had this talk about it, the honey that shows up just under the inner cover. So they build comb right up against the inner cover. So when you pull it off, what happens? We disrupt the stored honey and now there's honey everywhere. And the bees are a little bit desperate for honey right now. In fact, that smell goes into the air. And now we have bees that don't belong coming over to share in the honey that this colony produced and stored themselves. So what can you do about that? This will help you because when the bees get stuck in honey or we've got bees frantically flying in and out competing for honey, you have a greater opportunity 
to get them stuck in the honey where they can die? That's right, bees die in their own honey. It's amazing. But they're not normally going to be exposed to honey that has an open surface area. So what you can do, pry it up, crack the lid. Once you realize the inner cover is like that, or you pull it up and you realize you disrupted a bunch of honeycomb, there's honey leaking everywhere, close it right back up and give it a twist, 40 degrees. It's not specific, just give it a twist and then leave it alone. Go and do inspections on your other stuff or make notes about you know how great they're doing, how there's honey all the way up on top, because guess what they're going to do in the next hour? They're going to clean that up. And then when you open your hive, so go get coffee if you don't have a bunch of other hives. When you come back now and you open it up, you'll find they've cleaned that up and they've already cycled it back into other cells that are not disrupted. So they're not going to repair those cells really quick and put the honey right back in it. They're going to gorge on the honey and then they're going to move it around, which they often do. So then you have a nice clean um, surface to work with. So that reduces some of the bees that die and no smashing. The other thing is uh, pulling frames. The way you pull frames and you pull them to the side first, we remove the second frame in no matter which side you're starting on. So when you're closing up, push all your frames to the middle and lose the use the surplus space on either end uh, later for pulling a frame to the side and then pulling it out. If you kind of space your frames out a little bit to fill all the space, then what they're going to do is the joint between the frames, they're going to fill that with wax or propolis or both. And then you're not going to be able to push them back together. And the other part is you've eliminated your opportunity to pull them farther apart, which prevents rolling of bees. Rolling of bees is when you pull one frame up and it's in close proximity to the surface of the adjacent comb and the bees inside roll. Because part of this question too is, uh, what do you do with wonky comb? Well, when you've got wonky wavy comb, and you pull it up, they scrape against each other. So pull to the side, then lift. And here's the other thing, um, have a place to put the frames while you're doing your inspections that'll keep the bees calm. So there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, one, you could take them out and put them in something like a hive butler tote. That's what I use a lot. It holds frames, all the bees that are on the frames, of course, stay with it. And then you can keep them organized and there's not a bunch of banging and bumping around. And in my opinion, that's much better than having them hanging on a frame, even though I have really good uh, frames for holding, well, it's a frame holder. So it clips on the side of your bee box and you put your frames on that and you hang them. So those are the ones that get out of the way so that the next frames you can start pulling over. But I'd rather put them in a hive butler or some kind of tote that you can close up for a lot of reasons. When they're exposed and if there's any honey disrupted because of wonky comb, then there'll be honey that other bees will come after. So you need to be able to cover that and have them protected while you continue your inspection. The other thing is you can take what we call cotton duck cloth. And if you're an artist, I know probably a lot of you aren't, but look at art supply stores for unsized, it's called. In other words, untreated, unprimed, 100% cotton canvas cloth. And you get it in rolls and it's not that expensive. And uh, you can cut those pieces to the size of your frames or even make them or the size of your boxes and even make them longer. Why not? When you're doing your inspection, you pull the cover up, you just lay it over the whole thing. And then you start to roll it over as you pull each frame and then you go across and it also keeps your bees calm. So they don't feel so exposed when you get to the brood areas in particular, if you're going to take your time and you're trying to learn, you're going to be looking at frames and things like that it keeps the bees calmer and settled down below. It's because when they rise up and start flying and coming back and landing on the edges, that's when you're gonna smash bees, also between the frames. And here's where I get stung most frequently. It's when I'm picking up frames, if I'm not using any gloves, and I go to grab the ears on the ends of the frame, there's always a bee back there that I didn't see and stings my finger. So sliding first, looking and then picking up We'll spare you that. Now, what's the big deal? Anyway, if you kill a bee while you're doing your inspection. I'm sure a lot of experienced beekeepers have had this happen, and it, it really matters a lot when you're trying to show someone about bees. And you get in there, everything's fine. They're so calm, you know, none of them are watching you. You don't have guard bees up there lifting their forelimbs and opening their mandibles ready to give you a pinch. And uh, they're not they're not defensive yet. So you think, wow, this is really great. Almost don't need smoke. And then you're moving along, you start inspecting, now you smash a bee. 
Now they smash a beat and they, what the, what street fighters say is stuff like they come out. I had to come out. So that's when they show you that they're ready to defend the colony and that alarm pheromone that emits from a smash B can get them coming after you. So then they have a big disposition change and sometimes new beekeepers in particular will start smoking like crazy. Smoke yourself, smoke your hands, do everything that you can do to make yourself not the target of their defensive activity, but then stop. In other words, when you see them calm down and you see them turn away, you're no longer the subject of interest for those guard bees, don't keep smoking because the additional smoke creates a higher level of alarm also for the bees. So light smoking, cool smoke, easy smoke. So the biggest times for smashing them are when you're closing up more so than when you're opening things. So it matters too where you're putting your hive. This is a good point and I'm, I'm gonna plug the hive butler a little bit because we had a stream team uh, interview just a couple nights ago. And uh, if you don't know, that uh, Castle Hives hosts that also. And the stream team is Brian and Bruce and Greg. So they had me on to talk about honey, but then we were talking about what we do with our frames while we're doing honey and everything. And I mentioned the hive butlers and how to put your frames in those. And then the very next guest was none other than the inventor and owner of the hive butler company. So that was really interesting, but um, Here's the thing about uh, having a tote to put your frames in. If you are having difficulty lifting hives, there are a lot of people that say they only want to use medium hives, medium boxes, and that's okay. Or they might use an eight frame, or in some cases I'm even recommending five frame nucleus hives that are only three tall as the total hive, but that's something in itself. If you have a box that's really heavy, and especially when they're filling up with honey, and you have a 10 frame deep, for example, if you have something like a hive butler, they index your frames for you. They have dividers in them, they have additional space underneath, and when you're pulling a frame, you see that queen cell under production or something like that, and that's when you decide to make a split. They're the perfect support system to enclose that frame with all the bees on it, and that extra space underneath will not smash the queen cell. How many times have you pulled a frame out that is a queen cell hanging off the bottom. You go to put it in another hive body and there's propolis sticking up or there's comb or as this one says, wonky comb sticking up and you set that down on that and what happens to your queen cell? It smashes. So having the facility and having the equipment that you can move your frames to and then take them to another hive if you want to or keep them in order and then as you put everything back, you can do that, but it allows you to pull all the frames, have them completely protected with the bees on them, then pull the box, no heavy lifting. Now you're in the brood box and you can start to look for the queen or eggs or whatever status you're hoping to evaluate. So anyway, your biggest thing is being aware of where the bees are and having some way to move them out. You can sweep them with a broom and stuff, which inevitably gets really sticky too. If we have the circumstance that I described earlier where when you pull a box and now honey leaks out because the the comb between the frames has honey capped in it you pull that apart you have honey everywhere if you go sweeping the bees off with your brush your brush is going to get all covered with honey then what happens it's a bee magnet too so now you have bees coming after your brush among other things so the air blaster is a non-contact way and if I can find it I'll put a link to it down below but uh, it worked really well on the stuff that uh, I recently did. So those are the things I can think of. Um, that's pretty much it. I'm very much not in favor of pulling frames and putting them on the ground and leaning them, leaning them against your beehive. You don't know which bees are on that frame. In some cases, your queen can walk off. If you put them in a tote, they're not going anywhere. They're in there and you don't pick it up and have grass and stuff sticking all over your frame too. So I'll get off my soapbox on that. That was just question number one. So let's move on to question number two, which comes from Fred from Effingham, New Hampshire. It says, first year beekeeper with two hives, Russian and Carniolan mix. I'm curious whether you can mix bees. For example, you talk about making weaker colonies stronger by adding brood frames and nurse bees from a stronger hive to a weaker hive. Does this concept still apply if the bees are different types. 
Yes, it does. And this is coming up for me in this coming week, by the way. I have to do something with the colonies that are extremely strong. Uh, and we have some other colonies that were what we would call after swarms. In other words, the primary swarm emitted and they're the big healthy swarms that everybody wants to come and get. And then you have these after swarms that are much smaller. Maybe it's a pound or two of bees. They're marginal. They can barely make it. In other words, if conditions are perfect, they'll develop a small brood. And then you have to understand that the bees need to be able to do a lot of jobs at once. Therefore, more bees, the better these jobs can be accomplished. So when you have a colony and you've just collected a swarm, and that's just the example I'll use, and we put a swarm in a nucleus box because it is highly recommended that you put it in a small confined box. And five is enough, five deep frames and insulated cover. And this year I've not been feeding any of the swarms I've collected, even though in the past I've said late season swarm, feed them. But look where we are now. We're still in June for today, tomorrow, everything changes. But because uh, bees follow the calendar. So here's the thing. Um, we have an undersized colony of bees and we want to fortify them. One of the things that we can do, okay, and it does not, to answer this question right off the bat, mixing workers in a colony that's established that has a queen is not that big of a deal. So you can fortify them, you're giving them a workforce, the genetics are not changed at all. Now, part of the question would be, would they reject the bees that you're putting in because of their genetics? In other words, these bees are carniolans, and now you're going to put in a bunch of bee weaver, nurse bees, and workers, will they reject them? No, they really don't. It's kind of interesting that they don't, uh, particularly when you're doing it in mass. So thousands of them at a time. That's kind of key. If a worker from another colony that's not bringing a bunch of provisions with it lands on the landing board of a hive that's not their own, they often get rejected right away. And you'll see these tussles on the landing board and then two or three of the resident bees will start biting at their legs and then that bee flies off. So it knows, not welcome here. But I have a lot of ways of adding bees to a colony that's undersized. And it's also a way of relieving some of the high population density in other colonies. So you can take a tub out there, a plastic tub open. You don't have to close it, we're not trapping them. So then you go in the colony that's oversized and what time of day would you be doing that? Hopefully mid afternoon because we want most of the foragers out of the way. So you deal with some guard bees and you get to the brood area. And here's why we go to the brood area. We want the nurse bees. So we want those bees that are extremely valuable we also want to relieve some congestion there. They have brood, but the workers can come back and warm the brood. That's not hard. And if it's capped brood, which is preferred. So if you pick frames full of capped brood, then it's likely that your queen's not on there. And she's the one you want to watch for. We don't want to steal their queen. We just want to steal some of their workers, the friendliest workers, the most easygoing workers, and those with the most life ahead of them. So you take those frames and you shake them onto your open container. This can be a big plastic mixing bowl or something like that. Doesn't have to be a lot. Smooth surfaces preferred, and I'll explain why. Shake hundreds, if not thousands of bees in there, the more the better. You shake them off and you put those frames of brood right back in the hive that's overpopulated that we're trying to relieve some of that stress because we don't want any more swarms starting tomorrow. We're in July, swarming stops then. There'll be no more swarms. So you have to actively control your colonies, expansion, relieving congestion, and sharing the wealth. So I'm giving you the method for doing that. The reason we use an open container is those that have been around that fly a lot will fly off immediately. A whole bunch of the bees will be in there, handfuls of them, and they'll just be sitting there and they'll kind of cluster together, not really knowing right away where to be. And if you're not rough in your handling of them, other than the shaking off from the frame or using your air blower, not recommending that, haven't tried it yet to blow bees off of a frame. But now that I'm thinking about it right now, I don't see why that wouldn't work. So you could blow them into your bowl and then they sit there and then you take that over to the hive that you want to fortify. And here's what's interesting. You don't have to open that hive that you want to fortify and shake them in the top. What do you risk there? Well, you're going to break it. Uh, you're going to smash some bees. You have to break the seal and everything else. And it's a colony that's already struggling, right? So 
you do have to verify that they're queen right or this isn't going to work. So assuming it's queen right and we're just trying to fortify things, I think Fred here in Effingham uh, thinks that both are queen right, he just wants to fortify another one. You can take that bowl and you can tip it right up and bring it in physical contact with the landing board right in front of the entrance. And those little nurse bees, you can tip it up and they will walk right in there because they will accept any queen. It's really weird. Uh, and they'll just walk in. And guess what else? Because they're nurse bees, they must smell better or something. They must know that they're full of nutrition because the guard bees give them a pass. They check them really quick, but then in they go. I have never seen them rejected when you deliver thousands of nurse bees to a colony that's undermanned, right? So that way works really well. And here's another thing that I've been doing, and a lot of people have written about the QMP, the queen mandibular pheromone, the noodles that we zip tie to branches and things like that. I had to go out and get all mine off my branches. Um, because I was having troubles telling, is that a real swarm that went on to that? Or is that just a bunch of random bees that collected on the branch because it smelled like a queen? And so here's a key, here's a great way to tell. Are they just a bunch of bees that responded to the pheromone and collected there because this happens? Or was it an actual swarm, which now is an after swarm, that's why it's small, because the QMP swarms are pretty small. And then they sit there for a day and then my wife talks to me about them, says those bees are still on that tree branch. I said, I know there's no queen. That's a QMP thing. So now I have to take them off the branch and then I take those to whatever hive I think needs fortification. So after they've been hanging there for a day or more, then I take them and I just dump them right on the landing board or put them adjacent to the landing board and they'll walk in because they've already proven they will just follow a pheromone not a specific queen. And that's really interesting to me. So it's become a way to just go out, look at your beehives, and then I look at my QMP um, pheromone tagged branches and I just pull whatever bees happen to be on there. And now they've flown out. So these are not nurse bees. These are actual foragers that were just coming and going flew through a pheromone stream and rerouted themselves and collected on a branch, which has absolutely nothing to do with their parent colony. So I take those off and I did it several times on one hive in particular. I just get my cup of coffee. I go out there, I collect a bunch of those bees off of that branch. I dump them on this hive's landing board, or if I want to be really nice about it, or if the cluster is really big, then I get my cotton butterfly net. I shake them into that, spritz them with some sugar syrup, maybe touched upon a little bit with Honey Bee Healthy to make them all smell good and it gives them something to eat. And then I just lean that in the net on the edge of the landing board, in they go. They don't go immediately. This is a game of patience. So once the first two or three get up there, get on the top, smell a queen pheromone inside that hive and move in, it's important that they not have a queen mandibular pheromone with them. So in they go. And this has worked. I have tripled the population of one of my small colonies just by doing that. And we have forages that are ready to go. They start doing orientation flights. They accept that new residence. It's really interesting. Now, what do I care if a few of those end up quitting and going back to whatever colony they originated from? Doesn't matter. They're free bees anyway. So those are a couple of methods. Shake nurses into a bucket or something, smooth buckets, you can pour them right out, nice and easy. The whole game is not to jam them up too much. These are young bees and we want them to have a good experience. So the other thing I experimented with was uh, leaving them in the bucket and then putting a cotton rag into the bucket so it's in contact with them and then using those spring clips and clipping the other end of the rag on the landing board and they do eventually walk up it, but I mean eventually. You can be out there. I don't recommend you sit out there for hours unless you just enjoy being outside. But uh, it can take them all night and into the following morning to actually go up and inside the hive. And how do I know then that they went in? Uh, you almost don't know that they went in other than that they're not there anymore and that there's more activity in the colony that you're reinforcing and you go back and check the branch and it has not filled itself up again. So they didn't go back to the branch. So those are a lot of ways to do it. And the nurse bees like don't go anywhere except in whatever hive you put them in front of. 
And again, I've never seen them attacked. So I mentioned before that I took the QMP noodles off of my branches. And for those of you who don't know what that's about, uh, they're designed to be a temporary queen and they're designed to be a placeholder inside a hive to suppress reproduction of worker bees that would otherwise become laying workers with the QMP there. They perceive that there's a queen present, therefore you don't end up with laying workers until you put a new queen in and you have to do that. But once I've used it on these branches since early spring, they're gone now. These branches have little bits of beeswax on them and stuff. So the clusters that have been there have built a little bit of the foundation of wax honeycomb. And so now that becomes the residual pheromone. That's why we don't need the QMP noodles anymore. And the foraging bees collect on that. And sometimes you'll see a bunch of them collect and then the following day they'll just be gone. So there's no queen in there. They just gave up. So that's good too, because if we weren't around, you don't want them sitting there until they just starve out because they're not foraging or anything. They're just clustered. They're not even searching for a residence because you don't see scouts leaving and coming back. This is an interesting dynamic. So it is important if you're using that method to collect them and hive them wherever you need them. So do, 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 do. that's it for that one. But that's an ongoing thing. I love shifting the numbers around, the bees around, and uh, collecting them off of, because these are bees that were ready to leave their hives anyway. Why else do they land on that branch? They're not faithful to their queen. We might as well put them where we want them because they defected. Question number three comes from B-H-O-L-T-08, another YouTube name. I always thought about keeping hives close to or directly on the ground. Thought it wasn't good, but lately I've been seeing videos of people putting their hives, swarm traps, on the ground. Is this a method of catching a swarm that is advised? We're still hoping for a swarm before it gets too late in the season if we haven't missed our chance already. And the location here is Moosip, Connecticut. Okay, so now this comes down to personal preference. You are going to see lots of beehives on the ground. 99% of the time, beehives on the ground are going to belong to commercial beekeepers. And the reason is because it's easier and often they'll be putting them down in pallets that have four hives on the pallet. Um, it really comes down to um, expediency when you're setting up your hives, collecting your hives, moving your hives around. So it's something I, I don't know if I've ever had my hives directly on the ground. I've had them on low hive stands and they didn't work and I'll explain why. There are a lot of reasons why uh, the backyard beekeeper, I'll make that caveat because I don't need all the commercial people to come after me and throw me down and hand me a football and say, run until we tackle you and stuff like that. Um, so the thing is, I have skunks where I live. So if I was on the ground, it's going to be harassed all the time. Skunks are going to go through, it's food for them. They're just going to feed on them. The other thing is normally close to the ground is damper. So... If we're thinking about the bees themselves, now we're not going to do completely what the bees want because let's be honest, they want to be high in the tree. They want to be way off the ground and way out of the scent line of predators like bears, right? So we've already kind of disrupted them by putting them in our backyards or in our fields and meadows at your weekend cottage, wherever you keep your bees. Uh, they're already pretty darn close to the ground. But uh, when you think about the ground conditions, there are a lot of things to consider before you put a beehive directly on the ground. The number one is the predators that are going to feed on your bees. Ants are going to march right in. You have no prayer of keeping ants from moving into your beehive. Usually they're under the inner cover. They're in the periphery. There are beetles that will chew the wood. There are ants that will climb on your hive. There are mice that now have it very convenient. They're right on the ground. They're going to chew on the sides. They could even chew a hole through the back of your hive if they wanted to. They have lots of time to work on the hive and go after it. The other thing is, if you have grass and things like that around your apiary at all, you're likely going to be mowing and weed whacking. So that's another vote for elevating your hive off the ground because now you can weed whack and you can mow and the discharge from your mower doesn't blow grass all over the landing board and bury the entrance and annoy the bees and get them after you. So there are a lot of practical reasons 
for why you don't want them directly on the ground. Another thing is, uh, if you get heavy rains and things like that, you can flood out a hive. Now, I don't know if you're in a flat area, on a hillside, or something like that, but when you put your hives on the ground, summer and winter, summer it's rain, the dampness is immediately up against them when they're on the ground. Moisture underneath the hive is constant. Uh, and in the winter time, they're going to get buried by snow, which may or may not be a bad thing wherever you live because sometimes the hive buried by snow is warmer because the snow insulates the hive. Sounds weird, but true. And then, uh, of course, because if it's like 10 degrees or 20 below zero or something like that, a snow, a snow covered hive is protected from those extremes. But then there comes the snow melt off and now your hive is on the ground. So now all the snow melt off is going to go after your bees. So it's just going to keep everything damp. And I can think of a full list of reasons why I don't want a hive sitting on the ground. Um, and so there are a lot of, you know, practical reasons for that. When you're inspecting your hive, would you like to work a hive that's on the ground when you have a brood box down there? And then others may say that, yeah, but if the brood box is on the bottom, then that means your supers now are waist height or chest high or easily accessible. So you can make kind of a debate either way on whether or not that's good for you. But if you're bending down to pick up your brood boxes and things like that, if you're doing it manually on the ground again, it's going to put more stress on your back. So for me, Landing boards 16 to 18 inches off the ground because that is out of the skunk zone. And uh, so skunks, insects, other mammals, the mice and uh, shrews and things like that, they can go right into your hive. If it's on the ground, you've just made that exponentially more convenient for them. Um, some of the new hives that I have actually have adjustable legs, so they're leveling. And uh, on those legs, uh, they're three quarter inch threaded and they have ant guards on them. So it's very easy to control and prevent ants from climbing up into and onto your hives when they're elevated. So it's just another thing. Air movement under the hive uh, helps to keep them cool. There's a shaded area under there. It just goes on and on. So there again, I think you'll probably find as many people with hives on the ground as you find with hives elevated. I personally want my hives elevated for the reasons that I've described. Um, and so the thing about, is this a method of catching a swarm that is advised? Now, here's the other thing. If you're going to put out a box that's been used for bees, eight frame, 10 frame, single deep, reduced entrance, uh, facing south, south by southeast, that kind of thing. We know statistically there are heights that bees prefer and distances from the apiary that sent the swarm out, right? The beehive is in an apiary and the swarms leave their whole thing is to spread their genetics around and they don't do that by moving in right next door. But uh, so we know there's optimum heights, optimum distances. However, if you put a hive on a stand in your apiary and it has some used comb in it, but is not full of honey, does not have food and resources in it that could be robbed, you just want drawn comb and things like that then you're going to find that uh, often early in spring or whenever swarms are happening, they self-occupy. And uh, those are just, again, they're a couple of feet off the ground in my case. In my apiary, I don't have a single empty hive box. Several of the hives were auto-occupied. I've ordered more hives. I'm out of hives. I have to, I'm going to be building more nucleus colonies and I might actually extend myself out into selling off nucleus hives because I have too many. So I thought, uh, since they're going to reproduce anyway, and they're going to move into hive boxes on their own, or if I'm going to have intermediate sized swarms, that can later build out and by fall be ready to go for winter. I could be selling nucleus hives. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, but, uh, as far as catching a swarm being preferred if it's on the ground, it would be against the bee's instinct if it were given other options. Because here's the thing. Bees will move into any shelter in a storm, so to speak. The longer they're bivouacked on a branch or on a tree or something like that, the more desperate they are to find any space to move into. 
So if they haven't been able to find, you know, an ideal location and an ideal cavity to move into, they start to look at anything else. And in some cases, guess what they do? They end up stuck on their branch and they just start building comb there, even though it's guaranteed they're going to die. But that shows a lack of cavities to move into. So a box on the ground, just based on what I know about bees, um, they would not be prone to move into that if there were other options that were elevated. So a couple of things you can do for those who like to do backyard experiments and things like that, of course, identical hive configurations, identical frames that are inside, drawn comb, not drawn comb, foundation, and so on. Drawn comb is going to be a big bonus when attracting bees to the space that you're trying to get them to occupy. Have one elevated, have one on the ground. See what happens. I suspect the one on the ground gets occupied uh, by a lot of other things. So I can't imagine mice passing that up. They're going to move right in there. You're going to see your entrance chewed open and mice are going to move in and build nests and they're going to be right up in your frames. And because uh, it's on the ground, it's convenient. It's just right where they want it to be. Everything is looking for shelter like that. So I hope that explains my thinking. What else? Lawn maintenance. Bending over, those are my notes. Higher off the ground, better for the bees. I had a friend that was a classmate of mine that owned a huge barn, and the barn's empty. And I thought, whoa, you have a barn that runs east and west, if we're talking about the, you know, the barn's roof. Now we have a loft, so we have a high area, and we have big openings in the wall or you can even make openings in the wall why don't you put all your beehives up there in the loft which is designed to hold thousands of pounds of hay put your beehives up there and run entrances just little cutouts in the wall in the barn wood in front of each hive and now look you're at the height they would prefer to be you have no concern about bears or anything you have a great area to maintain your hives, no matter if it's raining or snowing or anything else. And you've got this big block and tackle system to lower stuff down to what would have been the dairy area, the dairy barn, the milking area. And uh, now you can lower and raise, you know, the honey and things like that or hive equipment and so on. And she hadn't even thought of that. How cool is that setup? It was perfect for anything. So anyway, Raised is better. Let's move on. Question number four comes from Lynn Carl Junction, Missouri. And uh, so here we go. Oh, can you share a pic of your new water wall to water pollinators, mist or fogger? Okay. So here's the thing. This year, I always have water for my bees, by the way. Um, and we do have a pond, which which sounds like a swarm right now because the bees are all at the pond. The pond is low because of lack of rain. There's a lot of moss. They're on the moss. They love the moss to drink through. So here's the thing. The cover image for today was this nozzle. Now this one's not out on my water wall. And why is that? Because this is the, these are called fog it, water fog nozzles. And uh, this one is the super fine. And then I found out because this one uses half a gallon per minute if it's on full. So I found out there was an ultra fine nozzle, which is out there now, which when the water comes out of it, it's like a cloud, right? So the lightest breeze blows it. It looks like smoke from a distance. So my water wall is nothing but cinder blocks. I like cinder blocks uh, and it's got some pavers out there. But I like cinder blocks because they have these cavities in them. And in those cavities is where you put your other feeders that have your salt water and things like that. It provides shade and shelter for the bees. And what happens is this nozzle aims straight up and the wind just gradually blows it this way or it blows it this way and then back against the wall. And what happens is the wall stays damp and then it will drip occasionally. And the bees like to land on it to drink the water. So it has a misty cooling effect. Plus when the wind blows a little bit stronger, that little mist cloud of water goes all the way over and hits beehives. It doesn't make them wet, but it has a cooling effect on them. So depending on where you live, I don't know if you have water restrictions or things like that, but that one uses a quarter gallon per minute. Now I'm gonna put a link down in the video description and you can look it up for yourself. I haven't reviewed it yet. I haven't made a video about it because I'm seeing how my wall works the best. And I did discover something kind of fun. 
Uh, the bees, and by the way, there's no risk of drowning that way, which is why I wanted that design. Uh, the mist just keeps everything damp and the bees can glean water from that. So it's really interesting. And the bees will move in even with the mist falling on them and they'll drink with mist falling on them. So it's not a problem. Uh, the other thing I noticed was I had some indoor outdoor carpet laying over the propane tank and, uh, we had rain and, Guess what the bees did? The bees were showing a preference for landing on indoor outdoor carpet and drinking from the water that was retained in the fibers. So then I thought, hmm, indoor outdoor carpet. That's another thing that would prevent them from uh, getting stuck and drowning. And you could drape that over rocks or a log or a fence or something like that and then have your mister spray the carpet, keep that wet, and your bees can drink from that. So I was thinking you could do that with other fabrics. So if you'd much rather use 100% cotton or something like that, like old sheets, for example, then uh, you could be spraying those with water or just have a water, just have a hose lightly dripping on 100% cotton sheets or old cotton towels or something like that. And then eventually it would become saturated and the beads would land on that and drink and they're not getting their feet caught. So interesting stuff that you kind of learn. Now the question comes down to, do you have somebody around who cares about how that might look? Does that look sloppy? Does that look like you're not taking care of your property? Or are bees so important to you that you're willing to put out old towels, old washcloths, and things like that that are cotton and letting them get wet from your mister so that your bees can drink? And I think the, uh, the answer to that is clear that bees come first before appearances. So, and today if I remember, and I hope I do, I'll, I do have video of it working and I'll show that at the very end. So after the credits, stick around and you'll be able to see the, the water wall and how expertly constructed it is. Question number five comes from Brad, Chester, New Hampshire. I was watching Naked and Afraid, really Brad? Anyway, I was watching Naked and Afraid today, and they found a honeybee colony in a tree. One participant was a beekeeper, and he smoked the entrance and said that the bees will engorge themselves with honey from the smoke, and they can't bend their abdomen to be able to sting you. It worked. Some participants were covered in bees, but not a single sting. Is this true? Okay. So naked and afraid. For those of you who don't know, if you're in other parts of the world, there may be copycats of this, but the whole premise of that show, so I'm told, is that uh, these people go out and they mix them up with people they don't know. Usually it's a couple, and so I'm told. And uh, they uh, are without the benefit of clothing, and then they have to survive. And so uh, they can't be very self-conscious people. And so apparently in this episode, according to Brad, because he watched it, um, they were messing with bees. So the part about smoking them, that's good. We all know that. We're beekeepers. We know smoke calms the bees. Does it prevent them from bending their abdomen and stinging? There's nothing I can find anywhere from anyone from any source that suggests that smoking bees prevents them from performing any physical activity that they can normally perform. So bending and stinging They'll still sting you when they've been smoked. If you put something on them or you antagonize them, they're just calmer and it takes more of an effort to get stung by bees that are smoked. So these people that are completely covered uh, with bees and not getting stung, that's not that big of a feat actually without the benefit of clothing because that's been done before. Um, there's a DVD out or a movie out, a documentary called Queen of the Sun. And if you notice the very opening sequence, the woman who does bee um, ceremonies, her name is Sarah Mapelli, and she is also without the benefit of clothing, and she is only wearing honeybees, and she's not even smoking them. So, um, the way that that would bend, you know, if they can bend and sting you and stuff like that, no, but it calms them, and, you know, people can be covered in bees. Look, when people don't have a bunch of fur and texture and things like that, like a bear, 
uh, your chances of being stung are greatly reduced. Now, slap one B, smash one B, and those people better watch out. So that sounds like an interesting episode. Um, and that's an interesting question. But for those who are wondering, it does not stop them from stinging you. If uh, it does not stop them from bending their abdomen so they can sting. The other thing is they don't have to bend their abdomen to sting. It works even when it's straight out. So that's... Uh, some interesting kind of, uh, probably the guy was trying to convince them that everything's okay, that they're, they're physically incapacitated as well as calm. Moving on to question number six from Jim from Morganton, Georgia. My bees have suddenly gone back to my pollen feeders, so we must be in a dearth. But for the past three weeks, my colonies will not allow drones into the hives. Yesterday, I found three graveyards of drones immediately in front of my long Langstroth hives. My mentor says the workers are killing the drones inside the hives and just dumping the bodies out the front door. Is this normal behavior? I posted two pictures on the Facebook page. So for those of you who are wondering about the Facebook page, there is a Facebook group called uh, The Way to Be, and it's a way to be fellowship. So that is... I sponsor that site, and that is my Facebook social group, so you can check that out. But um, yes, it's perfectly normal whenever there's a dearth. We associate this behavior with the end of the year because reproduction is off the table then, and the worker bees do not keep drones around when the resources are not also going to support reproduction of the entire colony. So it's different from reproduction, brood first. So worker brood gets number one attention. Drones are a surplus. That's why the colonies that are the most successful, that are the best provisioned, end up with the highest population of drones. For those of you who don't know, drones are the male bees. And uh, they're just a reproductive resource for the colony. So anytime there's a dearth, they're doing a couple of things. One, they are making fat-bodied bees too, which we refer to as fat-bodied winter bees. And what that is, is those are bees that get a whole bunch of extra nourishment and they're there in a period of dearth, like wintertime, uh, to sustain the colony. They become the core resource for brood in the colony for extended periods of time. And so colonies that react that way and do that, they're reinforcing their um, worker bees, their nurse bees, and creating these fat-bodied bees to get through that. At the same time, they're cutting the fat and that means male bees. So they starve them. They stop feeding them. Uh, and some of these drones are very persistent. So you will see drones flying from hive to hive, hitting landing boards and trying to be fed by the bees that are there, and the bees don't feed them in a dearth. And then when that happens, uh, the drone is supposed to leave. He's just supposed to go out there and starve to death on his own and just keep his pride. But what happens is some of them become so persistent that the next level is they start biting the drone and pushing him out. And beyond that, if they don't get that message, they'll even sting the drones. And if they're stinging them, does that mean they lose their stinger and that the worker bee also dies? So do we just lose a productive member of that colony to take that drone out? No, because of the way that they're stinging them, their uh, stingers do not become embedded and don't hook up in the flesh of that the way they would uh, the flesh of an animal, which holds the stinger and then the stinger detaches and the worker dies. So it's true. They're killing the drones and... Uh, they're at your pollen feeders, which I find interesting. Um, so the other thing is, we have unusual weather extremes now. So these could be judgment calls for a lot of people who don't like to supplementally feed their colonies. Um, sometimes uh, it can take a very small amount of resources supplemented to your colonies. That can mean the difference between that colony expiring or existing. And there are Darwinian keepers out there who will say, well, if they expire, they expire. And then those that we have that are the core bees that survive these extremes and these dearth periods at times when we normally wouldn't have a dearth, um, then those are the stock that we want to work from. So there's some merit to that. But as backyard beekeepers, you're probably not doing a lot for the stock of your bees in your area. So that's a judgment call if you just want to boost your colony a little bit. But unless there's also an abundance of nectar, Boosting them with pollen resources probably won't work. If they brood up in a time of dearth, they're going to depend on you even more. So what I much prefer they do is reduce their brood and match what's going on in the environment 
And because the bees do this on their own, they uh, reduce their expenses and drones are an expense. So out they go and they reduce their flight. So often during periods of dearth, you might be looking at a colony thinking, wow, there's hardly anybody flying. What is going on? Are they just dying out? No, they're conserving energy. So just as in the wintertime, and we don't see bees flying because it's cold, in periods of dearth, you may see not a lot of coming and going from the hive, and that's because they have what they need, or they can't justify the caloric expense of flying out and trying to find nectar where it doesn't exist. So now, on the flip side of that, if one of them does fly out, finds a resource that's abundant, because it's the other thing, they respond to the amount of whatever it is that they've found, that forager flies back, does a waggle dance, now they're active again because they found it. So what they've done is they've, they've reduced themselves to a holiday routine. So they're just milling about. And if you could look inside the hive, you will see thousands of bees parked, doing nothing. In some cases, they beard on the outside of the hive if it's hot and humid in there. And again, they're parked and they're not active. They're saving their resources, they're saving their energy, and then when there are resources available, let's say a big rainstorm comes through or something like that, and there's a big bloom of something for us here that's going to be milkweed really soon, um, all of a sudden they become active again and out they go and they're flying. So bees are economists and they're going to do exactly what we just described. So that's it. Yes, it's true. They'll kill them any period of dearth starving them and everything else. The very last living thing inside that hive that's going to receive feed and resources will be your queen. Question number seven comes from Nicole from, let's see, New Orleans, Louisiana. You talk about a hot area right now. I don't know how you guys are handling it. Oh, anyway, it starts right off. It's been very hot here lately. No kidding, triple digits. On Monday, I noticed my bees were bearding which is not a surprise, but from Tuesday through the rest of the week, I have seen little activities with the one hive. Should I be worried? I think um, for Nicole, it could tie in with the previous question that uh, there might be a semi-dearth going on there and they're economizing their activity. The other thing is you could do a cursory inspection just to see if they're in there, but I also recommend just putting your head up against the hive and listening. And uh, for those of you who do open feeding and things like that, if you're not supering, if you know it's a tough year, you're not going to super with honey and things, you know, with honey that you're going to consume or sell or something like that, um, you could feed your colonies if this is a very unusual extreme. Now, the biggest thing for the heat and everything else that's going on down there is making sure that they have lots of water. But I think of New Orleans as having a lot of wetland, a lot of water available to the bees. So the only thing then that they would be lacking would be the carbohydrates uh, to sustain themselves because they use a lot of energy to cool a hive. And water's fine, but they have to be able to spread the water around, they have to feed each other water, and then they have to fan it to cool the hive through evaporation. All of that takes energy, and the energy is going to come from sugar. So they need sugar syrup if they have nothing else coming in. So if you have no forage for those bees, you want to keep those colonies alive, at a bare minimum, you would be putting one-to-one -one sugar syrup uh, in your hive feeders and hopefully inside on the top. And uh, don't add things like Honeybee Healthy or Pro Health or anything else in there that has an aroma because if other colonies in the area are also in this dearth and desperate for sugar syrup and high sugar content resources, then the likelihood of robbing has also increased. So be very careful about that. I would put strictly sugar syrup in one-to-one -one by weight. And uh, that's not critical, you know, but that's the syrup that would most help them this time of year. So check them out, see if they're just economizing their movements. And uh, let's see, and it doesn't say whether Nicole has other colonies to compare with. Um, so maybe check in with other beekeepers too to see if their bees are also showing a lack of activity. So I would personally, me, I would feed those bees and check to see what the numbers are and keep them sustained. Question number, oh, that was it. That was the last question of the day. We're in the fluff section. So 
One of the things, um, when I was invited to talk uh, with the stream team, it, my topic was supposed to be honey. And we talked a little bit about honey, but uh, I prepared for that talk and didn't um, hit on a lot of points about honey that I thought would be mentioned. So instead it was about kind of what do you need to extract honey? You know, when's a good time to extract and things like that. But uh, one of the funny things I'd come across, uh, I was looking for, you know, key things about honey that might be interesting to people. And one of the things I looked for was the most expensive honey. And I always thought it would be Manuka honey, you know, because people talk about its medicinal values. It's really expensive. If you've ever looked it up, you know it's expensive, but there is something that sounds fake, but it's real. And this is funny, the most expensive honey in the world. Are you ready for this? It's called elvish honey. So you think made by elves? Anyway, uh, it's produced in Turkey and it's sold for up to $6,800 per kilogram. You can also find out what the conversion rate is, but anyway, it would be only for the extremely wealthy. So then that led me down the rabbit hole. I needed to know why is that honey expensive unless somebody is telling people it's made by elves. But it's the costliest honey and it's rare and expensive because it comes from the Turkey Black Sea region and it's known for its unique flavor. It better be for its high price and so on. But here's the key. It's extracted from a cave that's 1,800 meters deep in the Artvin city of Turkey. And that's one of the major reasons that it costs so much. So anyway, that's very interesting. I thought that there was honey that's so expensive. But let's talk about the plan of the week here a little bit. And uh, I want to thank the stream team for having me on. And uh, don't forget that the Hive Butler, they have a discount coupon. That's Fred. Five F R E D five. So I'm guessing that's five percent off. I don't get anything for that. It's just something that they mentioned that they will honor that for my viewers. Anyway, the other thing is uh, when you find supers that are full of honey right now and you don't want to add more supers and create these giant tall towers of honey, then uh, you can checkerboard them. So you can go out with some kind of tote or some way to enclose and protect these frames of honey and every other frame you would checkerboard by putting in an undrawn foundation. It'll keep your bees busy and you don't need to keep adding boxes. So I think that's a real great way to go. And uh, what else? Be ready, of course, uh, work out what your extraction is going to be for your honey supers, uh, how you're gonna get the honey off, how you're going to store frames after honey's been extracted and things like that. Making spaces for storage is what I'm talking about. It's really important. Work out how you're going to do it. Do you have somebody that has an extractor? Do you want to shop for an extractor? You're going to get a hand crank one, which is what I used for many years. I bought an extractor in my first year of beekeeping uh, because they did have bees that produced a surplus of honey the first year. Go figure. It's very interesting. But now I use a motorized one, so those are things to consider. Um, the other thing is uh, make sure you have enough frames because for us, now I don't know if you have you know, a nectar flow once, like some people get it only in spring and then they're done and that's it. Now here where I live in the Northeastern United States, we just wrapped up probably our big nectar flow, but we're not in a dearth. And so we have other things. As I mentioned before, milkweed is about to open. We have clover everywhere. I just posted this morning, uh, Washington hawthorn trees are just full of bees right now. So they have a lot of resources where I live, but we're going to get a semi low production period. And then we're going to go right into goldenrod, asters, maximilian, sunflowers are way late this year because of the lack of rain. And uh, so late in the year, we're going to get a whole bunch more. So we need to be prepared for that because guess what else is going to happen if you don't pull off honey and make room for these bees. And I'm not saying pull off all the honey. Here's my configuration. A single deep box, whether that's eight frame or 10 frame Langstroth box. On that, you should have a medium super full of honey. That's all for the bees. None of that is for you. So then, and this is just my practice. So then the third box that you put on, that becomes surplus honey. And that's the super that I'm talking about. Anything the third box and up, you can start to take off honey. Because even if you make a mistake 
and after you took off the honey, all of a sudden look out, we're in a dearth. This is why I'm saying checkerboard, don't remove the whole thing. So we're still leaving frames of fully capped honey and every other frame of capped honey you're removing and harvesting. Then we'll let the bees clean it up and we'll put it back. So that's what checkerboarding is and it keeps you from adding boxes. So, and the other thing is insulation. I've heard several people say that they remove insulation for summer and then they're gonna put it on in winter. If, um, as I'm doing, if you're using insulated inner covers and uh, insulated feeder shims and things like that on top of your hives, there is no reason to take those off and store them during summer. Leave them on your hives because giving your bees the ability to control the climate inside the hive, even during these hot periods, having insulated covers, insulated inner covers is going to really benefit your bees. So leave them on, don't take them off. That's my opinion on that. Um, make sure this is your opportunity too to combine dwindling colonies that could be queenless with colonies that are queen right. So you could be combining those boxes and use the newspaper method. And for some people that's difficult because when they put you know, their queen, the colony that's missing their queen might be a deep brood box. And so to take that whole box and put it on another deep brood box or even a deep brood box with a super of honey on it, if they take that colony and they put it on as part of the combination process, now they've got this big deep box on top. Well, that's why we use the newsprint method to combine the two, because remember you're putting the colony without the queen on top of the colony that has one. Now, once that merge has happened, people have asked, do we have to then take out the paper? Now the bees will chew the paper and remove it. It's very easy. But then what I recommend you do after this combination has happened over a three day period, then put a queen escape, not a queen escape, put an escape board underneath that deep super that you put on there, get all the bees down in the lower boxes and then remove it all together and then restore the colony as it was before with mediums up above the deep. So it's very easy to do, but it's kind of late in the year now and given the weather conditions that we have starting new colonies and hoping that they're gonna build up large enough uh, to get through winter can actually be a challenge. So these real underdog colonies can be combined with other colonies. So that's it. Take notes on all your stuff. Make sure you know your queen status. Also, for those of you who are checking for varroa destructor mites, you need to know if your colonies are at all diseased. My mite levels continue to be extremely low. I want to know more about that. If any of you are having uh, low mite situations to the point that it's making you suspicious. I am very suspicious. I'm happy that I don't find mites. And it's not that uh, I've changed the method because the way I count mites has not changed through the years. I've been doing bees since 2006. So uh, something's going on with the mites. Now maybe it's just my climate. Who knows? Maybe the forest fires had something to do with it. Maybe it's the dearth. I don't know what's going on with mites. I would like to hear from more people about their mite loads and if they're getting these heavily infested uh, colonies with mites just as they would in other years or is there something going on that uh, has impacted the mites. Maybe there's some secret mite virus going around that's only killing off the mites. I don't know, I can only speculate. So the other thing is, this is a time to take advantage of things like seeds. So if you plant for your bees, and I do, a lot of the seed companies now, because the growing season has passed where people have seeded their property, uh, they're offering deep discounts on their seeds. So it's a great time to think about milkweed, hyssop, swamp milkweed, all the things that you would plant for your bees, sunflower seeds and things like that, uh, that the bees use. And uh, I think that's pretty much it for today. So I wanna thank you for watching and thank you for being here for The Way to Be. And I hope that wherever you are, you're staying out of the heavy smoke and that your bees are doing well. So have a fantastic weekend. Thank you for watching.